So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for um, coming to this presentation. Today I will be sharing with you um, studies on local government um, planning and budgeting. And um, here you go there. So these are, this is the outline of my presentation today. There will be two studies as mentioned earlier. First is the baseline study on fiscal and governance gaps in municipalities. And second is an assessment of the Philippine local government planning and budgeting framework. For each of these, I will present the motivation, research questions and objectives, the scope and methodology, the research results and findings, as well as the recommendations. Now for the first study, it is the local government support fund assistance to municipalities baseline study on fiscal and governance gaps. And I would like to thank at this point, um, our counterparts at PILG, as Dr. Reyes had thanked earlier, um, the PIDS management, RSD, RID for organizing this. I'd also like to thank the team, uh, Catherine Adaro, uh, Rixi Madawin, Angel Castillo, uh, Miro Capiri, and Alma Mariano, especially um, Lucy Melendez for, for this, this task. We have been working on this for the past two years. And um, the motivation behind the study is that for decades, the national government has been assisting local governments in the delivery of devolved basic services through targeted programs. So the DILG came to us, um, figuring out, we were figuring out how to, to, um, to be able to answer these questions first. How much do municipalities need to close the gap in key devolved infrastructure areas, such as local roads, rural health units, and evacuation centers? And this wasn't an easy task. This was actually um, couched in the preparation of the budget for how much would still be needed for the local government um, fund assistance to municipalities. So what we did here was um, for the first part of the year, we went to local governments and asked for an inventory of their um, infrastructure services. And I'll be explaining this in more detail later on. Now, the second um, question was, do municipalities follow the DILG prescribed development planning guidelines? And here, uh, the sub questions are what are current local development planning practices and how can local development planning be improved? Now, the objectives, as mentioned also earlier by Dr. Reyes, was to establish baseline information for municipalities. First on the existing fiscal and governance performance indicators. Second, to estimate infrastructure and fiscal gaps for local roads, rural health units and evacuation centers. And thirdly, to identify governance gaps in local development planning practices. Now the scope and methodology. So we covered all municipalities. This is basically a census of the um, of all municipalities. Um, we interviewed members of the planning team. So here we had the planning officer, we had the engineering officer, we had the it's either the budget officer or the accountant, as well as a representative from the CSO. So we use a mixed methods approach. Um, we engaged in analysis and process evaluation using both primary, sec primary and secondary data. We conducted desk reviews, key informant interviews, and focus group discussions. Now for the first part, for the first year that we were doing this, we estimated infrastructure and fiscal gaps based on the data directly collected from municipalities. So we had a, we had a bit of a problem finding consolidated data on the inventory of roads, um, rural health units and evacuation centers for municipalities. So what we did was we sent out templates to our counterparts at the DILG uh, SLGP office, and they submitted to us their existing infrastructure for those areas um, based on 2017 data. So that was 2017 data was our baseline information. Um, and the challenge also was in defining the ideal or targets for these key infrastructures. So what we did was we resorted to sectoral policy directions. What do I mean by that? In the case of local roads, we followed what DPIH had, uh, DPWH had prescribed that one of their targets was to pave all existing roads. So that was our target for local roads. In the case of evacuation centers, we prioritized the um, presence of a primary evacuation center in geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas or GDA areas, of which a municipality can have several. 
And thirdly, for rural health units, we we followed the HFEP of the Department of Health that there should be at least one um, per 20,000 population. So I'll be showing you the results of our estimate uh, in a bit. Now, for the second main part of this particular study was the identification of governance gaps. Because a lot of the desk review that we had conducted showed that there were still areas for improvement in local development planning that would ensure that the development projects that were implemented would really benefit the municipality at the soonest possible time. So we got to thinking that we could conduct um, a census of development planning practices of municipalities. So what we did was we followed the guidelines of the DILG, uh, drafted a, an instrument in order to be able to examine really how the planning team um, did this in practice. So what did we find? Well, what we found here, the, based on our desk review, this is the current fiscal performance of municipalities. So this has been a trend, and it was in 2016 that we had documented this, that uh, municipalities are largely dependent on the intergovernmental fiscal transfer called internal revenue allotment. In 2016, it was documented to be 73%. What this means is that they um, have relatively low local revenue effort, only at 17%. So uh, the local government income, local LGU income, is mostly from transfers from the national government. Now, this is important, especially when you link it with the mandate uh, in the local government code that 20% of what, at least 20% of what is given to local governments must be spent on development projects under the local development fund. And these development projects are the ones that would trigger development and trigger growth in the economy. Now, as of 2016, uh, municipalities spent only 76% of their local development fund, which means that um, they did not quite satisfy the mandated 20%, at least 20% of um, spending on development um, projects. And this has a large impact when it comes to the development of the locality. Now, what are the reasons behind this? Well, the reasons for current fiscal performance of municipalities was documented, we looked here, there is, based on the results of COA audit reports, they identified poor planning, lack of coordination, absence of project monitoring mechanisms, as the reason behind either non-implementation or delayed implementation of projects. Um, our results found, and I will be discussing this in more detail later on, because part of the development planning process is to prepare project brief uh, for the proposed programs, projects, and activities. And what we found was that only about half of municipalities prepare project briefs for their um, proposed programs, projects, and activities that are included in local development investment program. Now here I present to you the estimated infrastructure and fiscal gaps. We are answering the question, in 2017, how much did municipalities need to close the gap for roads, evacuation centers, and rural health units? So if you look at the first column here on the left, that's um, with the background of yellow, this is based on uh, submission of 1,190 municipalities. So this would be understated. And mind you, this is based on 2017 information. The need to pave all existing municipal roads would be about 133 billion pesos. To pave 8,331.41 kilometers of unpaved roads. So this is the very minimum. I'm assuming that it would be larger, especially now it's 2020. Um, as for the primary evacuation centers for municipalities with geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas, these are the GDAs. Uh, a municipality, mind you, may have several GDAs. Um, based on the 1,159 submissions, um, we would need between 2 to 12.2 billion pesos to build 488 buildings. 
Now, um, I forgot to mention that the standard by which we compute this is our government standard. So the DPWH has a prescribed costing as well as the DILG uh, per kilometer of road. So that's what we applied here. In the case of the primary evacuation centers, it would depend on the kind of evacuation center you need to build, depending on the area, how many families. So that's why we, we, um, we have this range, um, minimum and then possible maximum, but still not completely for the 1,373 municipalities. Now for the third um, estimate, uh, when it comes to the rural health units, and this might change now, especially um, after what has been going on, the challenge to our health sector. We estimated at the time in 2017 that there was still a need to build 1,638 rural health units. And again, the costing was based on the DOH costing and it depended on um, the location of the rural health unit, where it was, whether it was in a GIDA or an non-GIDA area. So that would range from 17.9 to 21.4 billion. billion. Um, so if you total this all, this would be about 166.9 billion pesos um, based on 2017 uh, information. Now, having said that, um, we went on to identifying governance gaps in local development planning. So your patients, please, I know this is a rather cluttered graph, but this captures the entire development planning process of local governments. Um, local governments are mandated to um, draft a comprehensive land use plan that is valid for nine years. Um, from this, they are also mandated to draft multi-year, multi-sectoral development plan, which is valid for six years. And it is similar, same time period as the Philippine development plan. Now, based on the comprehensive development plan, which is six year, um, each uh, seating um, local chief executive will draft their own term-based agenda, which is called the executive legislative agenda. And for the benefit of those who are not familiar with the Philippine um, local government uh, framework, it, Local chief executives have three year terms. Um, so that's why they would draft uh, based on the CDP or the six year plan, uh, an ELA, what we call an ELA. Now from this, there are implementation instruments that are drafted. The first of which would be the local development investment program. So the local development investment program are, uh, is a list of prioritized programs, projects and activities that are identified to be able to close the gap between where the municipality is at the beginning of the term to where it wants to get in its vision and mission. And from this, but the local development investment program is valid for three years. Um, in the Philippines, we have an annual budget and the planning, planning process is, uh, the planning period is longer. So this local development investment program must be prioritized again to, into an annual investment program. So you get the, the most important um, projects that you want to implement per year, and it should find its way into the annual budget uh, or the, the appropriation ordinance. So for example, if a newly seated mayor wants to build, let's say um, three kilometers of road in um, the three year term. So it could be possible if that's a priority that you would divide, okay, I'll build one kilometer of road per year, and that would be prioritized in my AIP. So, so this is the overall uh, local development planning framework. Now, our study, our survey focused on the drafting of the comprehensive development plan, which is the six-year plan. And here, as I mentioned earlier, we followed the DILG prescribed planning process, and we focused on the five steps. Okay. The first step was to organize and mobilize the planning team. The second step was to revisit existing plans, vision, mission, and sectoral goals. The third step was to prepare the ecological profile to depict the current state of the locality and identify a list of programs, projects, and activities to address the gap between said state and the vision. Now, this fourth step was to prioritize these um, programs and draft the local development investment program. And finally, it will, uh, the final step would be to prepare the needed implementation instruments. And these would be the 
capacity development um, TAPDEV programs for the LDIP as well as the um, monitoring and evaluation. Okay. Now, these are our results from the survey. Okay. So, almost all municipalities claim to have plans. However, when we checked their period of validity, these plans were mostly not updated. Okay. What do we mean by this? The first circle here looks at the validity of the comprehensive land use plan. And here, 1,254 municipalities claim to have the CLOP. But when we checked, because we asked them what the year of coverage of their, their most recent CLOPs were, only 64 or 5% of municipalities had CLOPs that were valid within a plus or minus eight year range from 2018. So the manner by which we reckoned was that we, inter we did our um, field work in 2019. So we said based on 2018, plus or minus eight years, if the CLOP covered that period, that would be considered as updated. So here, only 5% had updated CLUPs. When we went to the comprehensive development plans, uh, we can see that 89% uh, of municipalities claim to have the comprehensive development plan. But of those that claim to have the comprehensive development plan, only about 490 had those valid within. In this case, it was a five-year period, plus or minus five because the CDP should be valid for six years. Now, lastly, from the CDP, um, you should identify um, the programs, projects, and activities that you believe would help you get to where you want to go um, in your vision. When we asked about the, the presence of the LDIP, 97.7% of municipalities said that they did have an LDIP. But when we check the validity, which is now this time a three year period, so it's a plus or minus um, in 2018, um, it was only about 31% of municipalities that um, had valid or updated uh, local development investment programs. Now, now, here are the highlights of the results of the specific steps. And I'm happy to say that generally, the, the prescribed guidelines of the PILG are followed, but there are areas for improvement. Now for step one, okay, which is establishing the um, municipal planning team, as well as identifying um, the, the vision and mission, we see here in the circle here that it's the municipal planning development coordinator or the municipal planning teams themselves who are the ones who initiate the development or updating of the CDP, the LDIP, and ALP. So it's they do know the responsibilities, which is very um, happy to see. Um, and another very um, interesting result is when we go to step two is that it is nice to know that the vision of municipalities, 48%, are collectively determined by the local development council. So, so this would go to say that um, it is recognized by those in the community. It's not identified just by one person. It seems to say that um, it is collectively owned by those in the development council. Now, the third step, which is the, determining the current status of the municipality through the ecological profile. Um, it is, the DILG has two prescribed um, the data set tools that are the RAPIDS and the LDIS, which are prescribed. But it was interesting to find out that the community-based monitoring system uh, is the primary source of data um, of 57% of the municipalities. Um, and this is used in the identification of programs, projects, and activities. Now, the CBMS is not just used for their planning. Um, it's also used in identifying priority sectors as well as the basis of budgeting. However, um, there is also a cost entailed in implementing this uh, data gathering. So the LGUs have to allocate a budget for the conduct of development tools, though this is not done regularly based on our results. Now, again, this is a rather heavy um, slide, but if you could bear with me, um, this one pertains to steps four and step five of the planning process. 
Step four would be prioritizing the projects needed in the local development investment program. And step five would be the um, capacity development programs available for monitoring and for the LDIP itself. So if you look at the upper quadrant here, we asked what are the tools used by municipalities in screening PPAs for prioritization? Because um, they come up with a long list and then they have to prioritize which to implement. Now, the DILG guidelines offer that there are top three tools. Uh, the tool one is urgency test matrix. Tool two is the resource impact matrix. Tool three is the conflict comparability complementarity matrix. And though the urgency test matrix is commonly used by about 48% of the municipalities we interviewed, we noticed that the method of workshop and consultations is what is the primary tool used for prioritization of PPAs. Um, so this is not, uh, this was uh, an interesting, a very interesting result that they prioritize their projects based on workshops and consultations rather than the tools that are provided by the DILG uh, guidelines. Now, um, at the lower, continuing on with this idea, at the lower left quadrant, how do municipalities prepare their LDIPs? Well, as I mentioned earlier, 50% of municipalities always prepare project briefs. So that means that there is another proportion of municipalities that don't prepare project briefs regularly. So the challenge with this actually is that um, it would it might affect the quality of programs, projects, and activities that will be implemented, and this might um, have an effect as well on the development and growth in a particular locality. Um, I mentioned this also earlier, 68% of municipalities used workshops consultations as their basis for drafting the LDIP, contrary to the guidelines of tools one to three prescribed by DILG. And um, for this, this particular column, 68% of municipalities conducted a second round of prioritization. So in the DILG guidelines, there should be a long list, and then there should be a prioritization, first round, and then there should be a second round of prioritization. And according to the results of our survey, only 68% of municipalities did in fact do a second round of prioritization. Now, as we know, and as I mentioned earlier, this LDIP is valid for three years. Um, in order to be able to implement this, we'll, projects must be prioritized for a year on an annual basis, which is why there is what you call the annual investment program. So if you go to the upper right quadrant of the slide, how do municipalities finance their annual investment program? So here it says, we found that about half of surveyed municipalities were unable to finance their entire AIPs. And 51% uh, of these resorted to looking for other sources of financing. And this has huge implications later as well, as well as for the Mandanas, the effect of the Mandanas ruling. So if you can see here, 51.64% uh, look for other sources of financing, and 47.2% had received grant-type finance funding. So this grant-type funding were um, funding typically received from national government agency programs to assist local governments in the, the delivery of devolved services. So another interesting result, which I'll go back to later on when I discuss the entire planning budgeting framework, is that only 8.23% of the um, funding this, that's received by municipalities is endorsed by the Regional Development Council. So this is one of the, the proper um, methods of uh, seeking additional financing. Ideally, it should go through the Regional Development Council. What happens is that almost 39% is requested directly by the LGUs to the national government agencies, such as the DILG or the DPWH. So there. Um, in the, to, to end this slide, um, the lower right quadrant, how do municipalities monitor and evaluate their projects? Here we can see that only 38% of municipalities claim to have monitoring and evaluation mechanisms for their comprehensive development plan. And 82% um, of municipalities claim to have some capacity development programs for implementing the LDI. Now, some general findings and recommendations for this first study. Well, 
the first issue was the need for updating of plans. And one of the recommendations is to enforce strict compliance with the local government code um, mandate requiring the government, local governments to regularly update their plans. And I know that there have been continuous efforts on the part of the DILG. In fact, there was a memorandum circular issued last October. However, of course, um, I don't know how it plays out right now with the current condition of, uh, under this pandemic. Now, the second issue that we identified was that um, the data set or the used for ecological profiling is uh, rather different than what what is indicated. So perhaps um, oversight committees, uh, oversight agencies can revisit the rapids or reorient municipalities on its use for ecological profiling. Because if I understand correctly, elements of the CBMS actually are part of the, the rapids and the LDI. Um, third, the insufficient observance of ensuring the feasibility and quality of proposed investment programs uh, compromise potential development. As I mentioned earlier, uh, it's important that you know uh, and prioritize your programs, projects, and activities. And this would require compliance by municipalities to ensure project feasibility. This may need capacity building interventions in the preparation of project needs to ensure feasibility and improve the quality of investments. Um, the fourth is the evidence on arbitrary and lack of prioritization of investment programs could result in less impactful development projects and inefficient use of resources. So this is just to highlight to municipalities the importance of following the two round shortlisting and using the ILG prescribed criteria in prioritization, or perhaps right now would be the best time to, to revisit um, these criteria and work closely with uh, local governments as well in the process of prioritizing uh, programs, projects, and activities. And lastly, refers to the CAPDEV uh, instruments available to the local government. So here, strength and CAPDEV, especially in monitoring and evaluation projects. Okay, so the second study um, is an offshoot of the first study. And this lies heavily, the results of this study relies heavily on the results of the baseline study. So here, um, we assess the Philippine local government planning and budgeting framework. Now, what is the motivation behind this? In 2005, the World Bank found weak institutionalized planning in LGUs and a disconnect between national and regional provincial planning. In 2015, the DILG reported that only half of LGUs had formulated CDPs, and our results uh, in the baseline study showed that only about 40% for those municipalities are updated. Um, I'm just highlighting here the COA reports also, which identified poor planning, uh, monitoring, and prioritization of development projects as some reasons behind the underutilization of the development fund. Um, and as well, another motivation is the anticipated increase in intergovernmental fiscal transfers because of the Supreme Court's Mandanus ruling, um, which implies a larger amount, um, a broader tax base for the computation of these transfers, which would imply a larger amount going to LGUs, which would therefore imply a larger mandated amount of at least 20% going to the local development fund. Um, so the research questions are very simple. What is the current planning and budgeting framework for local governments? How is it situated in the national government planning and budgeting framework? And what are areas for improvement? Uh, the objectives primarily is to map out current local planning and budgeting framework in relation to national government planning and budgeting. And one of the motivations behind this is that there have been recent um, efforts really to align vertical integration of uh, local plans to the Philippine Development Plan, so that although we recognize the independence and the autonomy of local governments and their prioritization, it's also nice to be able to map out how they contribute to the development of the entire Philippine. Now, another objective is to identify strengths, weaknesses, and areas of improvement in this particular framework. So the data and methodology, we use mixed methods, um, process evaluation using primary and secondary data, Desk review, um, we use the results of the baseline study, which I won't repeat uh, anymore in our discussion. Uh, and then we use the KIIs with LGUs and oversight agencies. 
Now, these, this is a summary of the more the larger oversight national government agencies when it comes to local governments. So we have the DILG, of course, which is there to establish, mandate, uh, and formulate plans, policies, and programs to enhance administrative, technical, and fiscal capabilities of LGUs. We have the DBM and the DBM regional offices that issue annual local budget memoranda, review annual budgets of provinces, cities, municipalities, and Metro Manila, and also update the LGU chart of accounts with COA. We have the NEDA and the regional development councils under them, which are tasked to integrate uh, approved plans of provinces, highly urbanized cities, ICCs, in the regional development plans and in the Philippine development plan. Um, they are also tasked as well to formulate public investment programs, similar to the LDIP earlier that I mentioned. And we also have the DOF, the Bureau of Local Government Finance, which is tasked to supervise revenue operations and resource mobilization of LGU. So this is the mapping of the Philippine government planning and budgeting framework. So here we have, this is a rather heavy slide, we have the entire uh, Philippine budgeting and planning framework. So at the bottom here is what we had just discussed. This, this is the municipal, this would apply to the municipal and the component city development planning and budgeting process. So we had discussed the results of our baseline study on development planning for the municipality and how this six year plan should be embodied, um, instrumentalized in programs, projects and activities in the three year LDIP, which should be broken down into one year annual I, uh, investment programs that could be financed in the annual budget. So let's spend a bit of more time on the local planning and budgeting framework map. So that's the lower row I just highlighted earlier. So this one, if you see the, the, the gray shaded area, this one already we had discussed these, this looks at the development planning process and how it figures into the annual investment program. So I won't repeat this anymore. We just discussed this process, but uh, the annual investment program should find itself into the local annual budget. And this is the local annual budget process. It's very similar to the national budgeting process. We start first with budget preparation. So there's a budget call and um, the different divisions would prepare their budget depending on their budget scheme. Afterwards, there's budget authorization and review so it has to be enacted just, just as in the case of the National Expenditure Program, it will become law as the GAA. Such would be the case for local governments. It would be an appropriation ordinance. But uh, one thing I'd like to highlight here is that a higher levels of government may review the, the appropriation ordinances of lower levels of government. So this means that um, provinces would have the mandate to review the the appropriation ordinances of component cities and municipalities. Now, once the appropriation ordinance has been approved, this will already be executed throughout the year, and it would be followed with um, the review, budget accountability, and monitoring and evaluation, so that the results of the implementation in that particular year would feed back into the budget preparation of the succeeding fiscal year. So that's it. These are the principles in local budgeting, and they're very similar also to national budgeting. It should be policy based. Here, it's recognized that local governments have their own priorities, but uh, it should be harmonized in the development plans and reflected as well in their investment programs. Now, um, procurement planning and budgeting linkage, there should also be a linkage between the project procurement management plan and it should be consolidated into an annual procurement plan. Um, budgeting should also be performance informed. It uses performance information in appropriation documents to link funding to results and to provide for a more informed resource allocation and management. And budgeting should also particip be participatory. So this was taken from the budget of manuals dated 2016. Okay, now let's go back to the overall mapping. And what is important to highlight here is that we show the role that local governments, municipalities, and cities play in trying to attain the long-term vision of Ambition Natin 2040. So Ambition Natin 2040, we know, is a long-term view, 
and each administration we know drafts what you call the Philippine Development Plan. In our case, it's for 2017 to 2022. And right now, mid-year and because of the COVID pandemic, I know that we are, um, um, government authorities now are reviewing as well, the, the PDP. But this PDP, there have always been efforts to, to be able to integrate it in, with the regional development plan that would be drafted based on the provincial development plan. So that's the first column here. So the mandates allow for the NEDA through the Regional Development Council to have an iterative process with the provincial uh, government, provincial development council, in order to be able to draft the regional development plan. Now, this later on we will see is, is part of the current efforts of the national government to, to integrate in the, the, the entire planning process. But what could be improved um, would be actually the linkage between the municipal city development plan with the provincial development plans, because there is limited evidence as to whether um, this in fact uh, occurs. And the same thing happens for investment programs. But what's important here is that the arrows are two ways. So it's an iterative process. Each municipality's component cities and provinces are recognized to have their own different needs and priorities. But it's important also to recognize how they can contribute to uh, national development. Now, the process follows also similarly for public investment programs. Um, these are the programs, projects, and activities identified um, in the planning process that would get the municipality or the national government where it wants to get in the, at the end of each term. But here, it, the process is not so iterative. Um, by the NEDA ADB guidelines, it's really unique what local governments need in their localities in terms of development projects is unique. So this should uh, hopefully, ideally, feed into provincial development investment program, which should find its way into the regional investment program and subsequently the public uh, investment program. Now, similar also to local governments, um, that have three-year programs that have to find its way into an annual budget. The public investment program is a six-year thing um, at the national level. So we have to figure out how to break it down into the annual General Appropriations Act, which is drafted based on the national expenditure program or the president's budget, which is drafted by the, the Department of Budget and Management based on submissions of national government agencies. And here it's very interesting to highlight that um, I mentioned earlier that not all municipalities are able to finance their annual investment programs. So they seek grants from elsewhere. They seek funding from elsewhere. Some of them, I think it was 8%, seek grants from the Regional Development Council through the Regional Development Council. Um, some would go to the province, but most would go directly to national government agencies. Um, that have uh, programs that would uh, that are there to assist local governments in the delivery of their basic services. So this as well would have implications moving forward um, for when the Mandanas rule would be implemented. Okay, so um, for local planning, some findings and current efforts. As earlier, there is a need to encourage the updating of local plans. Um, there's also a need to ensure the quality of PPAs. In our study, we found that in 2019, the DILG and NEDA had a program called the localization of the PDP, which offered capacity building on identifying development outcomes, crafting of investment programs, and identifying what is needed to translate these programs into physical programs. So these are current efforts that could possibly be continued. Um, Section 114 of the Local Government Code indicates that local development plans may be, may be integrated with those of the next higher level of local development councils. However, it is articulated explicitly that the integration of provincial plans and investment programs to the PDP is mandated, and it should be done through the NEDAS RDC. Now, since provinces are seen as an important link in the harmonization of municipal city development plans, there is a need for strengthened oversight to ensure uh, the integration of uh, municipal and component city plans into provincial plans so that there is 
um, contribution, the contribution can be seen. Now for local budgeting, um, some findings and current efforts, though local government units are given the autonomy um, to determine their own budget, there are also mandates that allow for review by provincial governments of the appropriations ordinances of component cities and municipalities, and by the DBM regional offices of provincial highly urbanized and independent component appropriation budget. Now, um, for the first sub bullet here, the provincial government uh, oversight, there is limited evidence showing uh, regarding this. So this could perhaps also be something looked at by our national government oversight agency. Um, one current effort, well, not so current, this was in 2015, the oversight agencies institutionalized the Coordinating Committee on Decentralization, the national interagency team, and the regional interagency teams for better convergence across the different levels of local governments and with the national government to enhance public financial management. And what we learned as of the date of our study, which was last year, at the, the REAT offers capacity buildings for local budget forum on, on budget and expenditures management and guidelines. But um, the NIAT, which is a technical working group under the CCD, had yet at the time um, to be convened. So some final remarks. Uh, ensuring the attainment of development depends on the ability to implement well-laid plans. Um, strengthening planning, this entails both identifying needs in priority sectors, interventions necessary to attain development goals, and carefully crafting, crafting programs, projects, and activities to attain these goals. Across different levels of local governments, policies should encourage the vertical integration of plans and investment programs, though still recognizing the autonomy. And there is a need to establish expertise at the provincial level to mentor municipal counterparts. Now, financing these plans in the budget, there is a need to continue efforts of convergence in oversight agencies and continue moving towards integrated management information for real-time monitoring of PPAs, implementation, and budget utilization, as well as finally strengthening and monitoring evaluation functions guidelines within the context of convergence efforts as well. So that ends my presentation, and thank you very much.